morning. It's Wednesday, June 10th, 10 o'clock. It's a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, we're continuing our work on Act 250 related provisions. Uh, and for those trying to follow how things are moving uh, by agreement in the Senate, all the Act 250 work is being rolled into one relatively large amendment. It's going to be then uh, become part of the housing bill, uh, S-237 and travel together, one big bus. Um, however, so uh, we've talked about, and we're taking it in chunks. Uh, today we're uh, returning to uh, trails provisions and as per our usual MO, um, council has prepared some background information for us. And then we're gonna go to witnesses to walk through some details of different proposals on how we might um, make some progress on the trails provisions. So, um, you know, and one thing before we go into it, I know that there have been, uh, I've had numerous conversations in the last three days about uh, work. I know that we're all in a bit of a pressure cooker. Uh, COVID has been a stress on everyone, changed, upended a lot of lives. Uh, we've had a move to Zoom sessions, which are far less, I think, uh, a far less agreeable venue than sitting at a table when you're really working through difficult, intricate issues and the kind of back and forth that an in-person meeting affords. Um, and I'd say people are getting tired. So I'm going to um, uh, just say uh, I appreciate that some folks are being kind of stressed by what we're going through on all sides and I'll uh, just say ask us all to do our best um, and you know, keep on moving along here. So I just wanna recognize that we're in a difficult situation. We probably all need to be more patient with ourselves and others than, than, than maybe normal. So with that- Bring on the stress. Bring on the stress. <laughs> Bring on the stress. All right. Handle it. Uh, okay. So with that, I'd like to go to, uh, if there's no other comments from anyone, go on to uh, hear from Ms. Tchaikovsky. Good morning, Ellen. Good morning. <clears throat> so I don't have a PowerPoint today. We started uh, discussing recreational trails a few weeks ago where I did sort of a, a verbal walkthrough of the landscape, but I did provide a memo that is posted on your website, which is my sort of um, distilled high level analysis for determining if a recreational trail under Act 250 juris uh, current law um, needs an Act 250 permit. So we've talked about this before. Um, there are any current provisions in law specific to recreational trails under Act 250. So the regular analysis of the, the purpose of the development is sort of where you start. So is it for a commercial purpose? or is it for a state, county, municipal purpose? And uh, those give you the sort of relevant thresholds that you have to look at when you're deciding if your, your project will need an Act 250 permit. The um, Act 250 bill that came out of the house, H-926, contains language um, that makes amendments to uh, add recreational trail specific language to Act 250. This uh, type of language has been contemplated for a while. One of the tasks of the Commission on Act 250 was to look at re recreational trail regulation. And uh, so there was a stakeholder process that was set up and that process led to the language that's in H-926 currently. However, that language was added as a floor amendment to the bill. It um, didn't come out of House Natural specifically, although House Natural did review the language and approve it. That language is also on the website for today, your website for today, isolated as a single amendment so you can look at it and we will go through it. Thank you. 
So I think that's all I have at the moment, unless you have questions. No, I think so. Um, given our schedule, I'm feeling like we're, we're coming into Fisher cut bait season. So it's, I think it's be good to hear the proposals in front of us and start um, making sure we have a clear picture of what the decision points are and then start making those decisions so we can assemble uh, that amendment that we'll be working on. Um, with that, I know that we have Mr. Fidel and Mr. Coleman and Mr. Chapman who all, uh, I'm not sure, I leave it up to you in terms of, I don't know who wants to speak first. Uh, we can follow the agenda or we can, because you have all collaborated on this, um, I don't know if you want to uh, pick your own spokesperson to go first. Um, Senator Bray, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take the, uh, the first crack at that, give you a quick overview. Okay. And then um, I would refer you to what I'm going to review uh, is a document that I think you got from uh, Jamie Fidel uh, before our last hearing. I think that was last or Wednesday or Thursday, I can't remember. I can't remember the date, but it's under Jamie's name. Uh, but basically, it's a it's a narrative of the changes that are in H twenty six, which I can walk you through because if you look at them, it's sort of an isolation. It's not obvious, so I'll be able to give you the context for those for those uh, changes. Um, I can then talk to you about the uh, one amendment that I've that um, is under my name from, uh, from the last hearing that we can talk about at the, at the end because that would be in addition to what came over from H926. Uh, and then, um, you know, as questions come up, Matt, uh, Matt helped us work on the, uh, the language with, uh, with Ellen and obviously Jamie's here and we've worked on, we've worked on what's gonna be in front of you together. So I'll, uh, I'll try and just set the stage real quick and then, and then walk through that, uh, walk, walk through that memo. So okay. really the um, I'm just want to make sure that committee ahead. members who are going back will have that memo in hand. So I'm going through, I think it was either let me make sure I name. Um, um, last Thursday, that'd be yep. so uh, our documents list from last Thursday. Um, if people are trying to pull it up at the same time. Okay. Just and, and just sure. be Warren, before you go into it, I think it would be helpful for the, the committee to know that this is really the work product of Commissioner Snyder, this this memo, yeah. and that I, I forwarded it yeah. to, to Judith. Um, um, uh, but really, this is this is Commissioner Snyder's work product and and just wanted folks to know that. Okay. Yeah, and we'll just, this, this background, Commissioner Snyder put that document together to summarize to the for the uh, uh, for VOREC what was uh, what was in the, the house bill um but it does such a it does such a good job there was no reason for us to draft something different so that's why we're we've all just agreed to use that document okay and just to make sure we're looking at the very same thing it is uh in memo form at the top of the page two senate natural resources from jamie vidal date is june 4 2020 correct no i think they're talking about the one that's on friday Okay, that's why I want to pause and make sure we're looking at the same thing. You're right, Ellen, that's correct, it's Friday. <laughs> okay, so there, got it. Uh, Act 250 and Recreational Trails Bill language in bold underlined at the top. That yep, one. that's the one. Got that's it, correct. thank you. So really there's two, there's really, two pieces to, to this. One is um, basically codification. So we're gonna go through obviously the bill language so it's codification of various rules, uh, legal decisions, existing policy and practice. What we're trying to do is just provide clarity uh, of taking all these different pieces that have been evolving and, and amend uh, the uh, statute to provide some clarity on how Act 250 applies currently to Vermont trail system trails and also to provide some stability so that we can do uh, the remaining work that we need to do to come up with, with an alternative, which is gonna be the proposal that, uh, that we come back to you with in December. So the bill has those two sections. The first one is these clarifications, which I'll run through. 
And then the last piece is the directive for us and agency to come back to you in December with our, with our proposal. So, um, and these uh, clarifications uh, are uh, basically run for about a year and a half. This gets sunsetted, these provisions that we're gonna go through get sunsetted in uh, January 1 of 2022, because we estimated that that would be the sort of the time frame we would need to come back to you with a proposal to then get the statutory authority we need from you and to then engage in any rulemaking or additional process to, uh, to get the program ready to launch. So that's, that's sort of the, the overarching framework. Um, uh, and then the last thing I'll do at the end is uh, an addition that we're asking for to provide some additional sort of stability uh, in this interim period. Um, we talked very briefly last time about um, some existing jurisdictional opinions that have been requested. There's also the possibility for other jurisdictional opinions to pop up during this interim period. So I'll, I'll, I'll table that issue for the moment and just focus on what's currently in H926 and we can, we can run through it. Um, and just so you so take a look at that. Um, I'll ask Ms. Tchaikovsky to also, um, on behalf of the committee, sort of keep a, a running tab on uh, questions on behalf of the committee, if you would, please. Thanks. And Mr. Senator, Chair. I think we have those questions that you sent us via email before last Friday uh, okay. in mind. I think as we walk through this document, those, answer, those questions will, will be answered. Okay, Mr. Uh, Chair, Senator McDonald. Just um, we've done a lot of talking about something we haven't heard yet. What could, in a sentence or two, could you share with us the problem that you're trying to solve with this language? And yes, is just is it simply that trails don't lend themselves to the traditional thresholds for uh, Act 250 review, and we're trying to resolve that? Is that what you're trying to do? I think that's a large part of it, Senator. There's there's just uh, uncertainty for dealing with long linear projects, and when you hit certain thresholds, and when you're trying to connect one trail to another, do you look back and okay. see? Okay. So this is the it's not the spaghetti lot problem. It's the angel hair pasta problem. Long and skinny. I can I can go with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So um, what's probably uh, the most helpful thing to do is, is that document you have basically has uh, bulleted uh, narrative uh, sections that sort of identifies each one of these changes. Um, trying to figure out what's the best way to, what's the best way to do. I'll just go through at high level the, in a narrative form that the changes, and then we'll just run through the specific language. It'll, it'll, it'll be, I think it'll be pretty clear. One thing, so the first thing we're trying to do is clarify the definition of a trail. Right now, we've got different terms used in different, uh, in different places. We've got uh, language that's currently in, uh, in the Vermont Trail System Trail section of statute, which is separate from Act 250. And then we have other references to trail. So we're basically trying to create a uniform definition. I'll go through that in a little bit. Um, the, uh, the other thing that we're basically trying to do is we are trying to make clear what a Vermont trail systems trail is. It's something that's been established in, in Act 250 precedent. It's, it's, it's in the trail section of, of, uh, of, of, of legislation uh, for the Vermont trail system, but it's not, we're just, again, trying to, we're trying to bring pieces and parts that are out there and just put them all in one place. Um, uh, in, in the Act 250 section of a uh, statute. Um, and the reason that's significant is because a Vermont trail system trail is defined to be for a public purpose and it therefore has a higher jurisdictional threshold of 10 acres, which is, which is important for going back to Senator McDonald's uh, question before about, uh, uh, about jurisdictional thresholds. Um, then what we do uh, is for the this interim period of time that I described, we try and clarify uh, some of the issues that 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 people have been uh, people have been struggling with. Again, um, when uh, when the uh, when you have a Vermont system trail, that ten acres is a threshold. 
Uh, we try and clarify that when you're determining jurisdiction that it's the actual physical disturbance of the trail. So that, that basically that the corridor where you're doing ground disturbance or clearing. Um, again, these are things that, you know, these are things that are in case law and, and various pieces. We're just trying to pull it all in one place so somebody can read it and understand uh, what, the, what the lay of the land is. Um, again, more jurisdictional issues about when, uh, about calculating, um, uh, calculating when, when jurisdiction is triggered, when it's, when it's part of some other larger project. Um, it, it'll be clear when I go clear when I go through the specific language. Um, we try and clarify certain provisions uh, because most of these trail systems are on private uh, private property. So right now, the NRB has Rule seventy one that 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 tries to make it clear that jurisdiction applies over the trail. It doesn't extend to the other parts of the private property when the property owner is allowed. Uh, a trail to be located on their property. So again, we're trying to just take that rule and pull it in statute so everything's in one place. Um, uh, that's, that's the gist of it uh, for that piece. Um, we also try on the flip side to make it clear that when somebody is allowed a trail to be located on their property, if they need to do something like have a driveway across that trail or uh, uh, any other kind of road to access part of their parcel, they don't have to go get an amendment to the trail groups Act 250 uh, permit. Um, and then, as I said, the last piece really is, uh, the last piece really is about the report back. So I think the, probably the best thing to do is to flip to the third page of that document, which has the, which has the statutory language and I'll just, I can walk you through it. And I think the, the examples will become uh, will become clear and just stop if you if you've got a question you want to stop us um, please go ahead and do that okay um, uh, so the first before you launch center, let me just check uh, is, is every committee member have that document in hand or on their screen whatever so you can follow great thank you okay um, so the, the the first instance is we're amending section um, 442 in Title 10, that's the Vermont Trail Systems Trail section. That's not Act 250. So there's an existing definition of trails. Uh, what, what, what's being done there is trying to, is adding to say, trails doesn't include things that are primary for motor, primarily for motor vehicles. And this just came about um, uh, with, with AOT and others that were trying to make clear that things that we consider real roads for driving cars and uh, trucks and things on are not going to somehow be shoehorned into the definition of uh, of, of, of trails. Um, and uh, what we do next now as we get into um, uh, the Act 250 section 6001, we have the definitions. Uh, we define a recreational trail as the same thing as a trail under the under that other uh, uh, under that other chapter. So. That's the first time we're basically saying a recreational trail has the same meaning as a trail under under that prior uh, under that prior chapter. So we're again now we're trying to align the Act 250 definition with sort of our working recreational uh, definition for uh, for trails. Um, and then, can I jump in quickly? So as an aside, this isn't a question, but it's a sort of a flag. The H233 language that we discussed in regards to forest blocks also has a definition of recreational trail and it's different. And that isn't necessarily a big problem, but because it's um, exclusively for use when talking about forest fragmentation, it isolates that certain recreational trails are not fragmentation, um, but it is a different de uh, definition than what's being used here. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a good catch. And that's one of the things that, that under the forest frag section that I think we needed to, to make consist, consistent and the hope I think was to refer, make it consistent with the definition that we're setting here uh, in, this, in this piece. Okay. Rather and than, rather than I'll have a, third, a second or third definition of what a recreational trail is, what we're trying to do here is make sure we have one, one working definition. Great. Um, and so Ellen, as you gather these things up, if you can put them into a memo to share with the committee, it will give us a checklist to work back through to make sure we're not 
ending up with unintentional inconsistencies. Thank you. Great. The next new definition 51 is to now define a specific type of trail, which is the Vermont Trail Systems Trail. So this is a set of trails that's uh, uh, recognized by the Agency of Natural Resources um, and, and ultimately uh, is designated because it, 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 when it's designated, it then, it then has the benefit of being recognized for a state or municipal purpose and then is subject to the 10 acre the 10 acre threshold. So this definition is, is important because as you see in the next pieces, we're not trying to apply uh, uh, this language and sort of this clarifications necessarily to, to the entire universe. We're trying to recognize a specific subset of trails that the state has determined are important and for a public purpose and that have a, uh, already have oversight and go through an approval process at the, at the Agency of Natural Resources and at Forest Parks and Recreation in particular with approval for Vermont Trails and Greenways Council. So that's why that definition is there because it carries a separate, uh, a separate jurisdictional threshold. Um, and also it was something that was not, it was recognized through Act 250 cases, but it wasn't part of the Act 250 sort of definitions and, and lexicon. So turning the, uh, turning the page to XIII, so this is still, um, we're still uh, in the definition section. And this was one of your questions, Senator Bray, as you, I think you were trying to understand why we structured this piece this way. So this, this XIII is, is basically like a title section. It's basically saying, we're talking about, um, uh, we're talking about Vermont trail system trails on tracts of land that involve more than, uh, more than 10 acres. We're, we're talking about what's gonna, what's gonna govern uh, in Act 250, if you are a Vermont system trail and you and you've triggered, you're, you're above you're above the 10 acre uh, thresholds. This is think of this as sort of the title set section because these provisions are are sunset. So we wanted to make it so that they were contained in a way that that they were there together and they hung together. And then when the, the when the sunset period um, came about, you could extract that section out of statute cleanly rather than having this pieces scattered all over. So that's the idea is this is a sort of a self-contained section right here. So that's why you see a one, two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. So the next one, the next one is, did you have a question, Senator Bray? No, I was just saying, thank you. I, okay. I appreciate the sort of plug and play cleanliness of <laughs> amending this way. That was the idea, that was the idea. So the next one also is trying to be clear about what this covers. So we're trying to say this for this time period, again, because this is time limited, is the sole means for determining jurisdiction over a new or proposed trail that's going to be part of the Vermont trail system. Again, sort of trying to lay the, lay the groundwork for what, what, what exactly we're talking about. Um, and so then- no can I jump in? Yes. So I- can you explain the phrase, the exclusive mechanism for determining jurisdiction? Are you, so can you explain what you're doing with that? Are you trying to exclude amendment jurisdiction or what? I think the answer, well, I think the answer for, for this time limited period, the answers, the answers, yes. We're really talking about new Oh, we're talking about new trails or or proposed trails. So when we get down later, if uh, uh, we really wouldn't be looking at, uh, I think um, you know, amendment jurisdiction under this. We're saying for this time limited period, if you're part of the Vermont system trail system trail, this is how determined ju jurisdiction is going to be determined. Period. Okay. I'm looking to Matt if if he has any different way he would explain that. No, I mean, I think that that, that accurately, accurately represents the intent of what this is trying to do, which is, is basically, it's trying to ensure um, that other, other possibilities of determining jurisdiction under Act 250, which might come into play, don't with respect to trails, that it's limited expressly to these provisions um, that Warren's walking through. And if, if I if I could just add that I think yeah, please. Warren's right. I mean, the context was we if a trail is already under Act 250 and there's an amendment, 
uh, I don't think our intent was to say that you therefore can't go through the normal channels of amending for existing permits. This was looking forward to newly created. Right. So, if so there, if there's a clarification there. Um, so you know. I guess, so I'm a little bit confused because when when we're doing an analysis, like in the, the memo I wrote, I, I added that, yes, the sort of 10 acre, one acre threshold is one of the ways that you establish jurisdiction over a trail. Um, there is also an uh, the ability to establish if there's some um, broader commercial purpose uh, de uh, development that is going to be on the property, or if there's already a permit on the property on which the trail, the new trail will cross. So there's a couple of different ways to potentially be subject to jurisdiction because of the numerous ways that de development is defined. So okay. I, I just haven't seen that phrase before and I found it to be a bit confusing. Yeah, I think, again, I think it was just because it's, it's we try to make this a time limited period that we were trying to simplify things for, for that you know, for that, uh, for that period and say, this is, you know, and, and I think as maybe as we walk through it, it might answer some of the, some of the, uh, some of the questions. So if we look at two, uh, this part's only going to apply for construction improvements as of July 1st going forward. Um, and three, we do two things. We define sort of all the sort of ancillary type of infrastructure and things that would go along with a, uh, 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 with a trail and say you would include those in determining jurisdiction. So restrooms, parking, uh, things of that nature. Um, but real, the key provision here is the last sentence, which says involved land does not include any recreational trail constructed before July 1, 2020. And this gets to Senator McDonald's um, uh, question and statement before. This is one of the areas that um, has caused some confusion or there's some uncertainty about how to how to determine uh, when you're uh, looking at a trail that's been constructed uh, uh, prior in time to maybe a section of trail that you're adding on to uh, and when that does or doesn't uh, uh, get aggregated to your project and potentially trigger Act 250. What we've all agreed to for again for this time limited period is basically saying from July 1st going forward, we're not gonna look back at, at, at other sections of trail for purposes of determining jurisdiction and trying to aggregate things and, and figure out whether you're over 10 acres or not. We're just saying for this time period, we're not, we're not gonna be looking, we're not gonna be looking back at trails that were, that were built before July 2020 for purposes of determining jurisdiction. So it was just, that was the, that was the idea for this period of time. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator McDowell. Er is the witness saying that acres are not an efficient, appropriate, or useful way to measure trails for the purpose of regulation? Uh, I, I think that's what we're trying to get away from, at least at this, at this period of time. We basically think, you know, and this is what we're trying to work on to bring back to you in December, which is, which is Trails should all be under the same guidelines and practices, whether whether it's you know an acre or whether it's thirty acres. Um, you know, regardless of length, they should all have the same technical standards. They should have the same maintenance requirements. Thank you. And asserting actors. I will listen to the testimony with the understanding that what we're going to hear is consistent with the goal of recognizing that trails just don't fit the Act Two. 50 definitions and are causing ongoing concerns. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. That's that Thanks. makes sense. Um, okay. Warren, quick question on sub two, um, that yep. the subdivision shall apply to construction of improvements. So uh, how does that relate? I mean, I get the kind of clean slate. We're in a box that starts on July 1. We're moving forward during a pilot or whatever we might call it. Um, but if you start doing improvements, then you're talking, you're necessarily talking about pre-existing projects, right? So are you sort of dipping back in to things already permitted or regulated? I'm just trying to make sure I, we don't. I don't, I don't think that, that was the intent. I think the intent improvements is used to mean that you're, you know, sort of the creation of 
of the trail or again, new trail after uh, July 1st, um, which could include trail, but it could include other, you know, other pieces. It could include the picnic area and the kiosk and the shelter and, and things of things of uh, things of that nature. So I don't think we're we're thinking about sort of the the, the reaching back. I mean, that's make, put it this way: if someone's going back and doing maintenance or upgrades on their trail, uh, that's something that they are are already obligated to do and would not would not trigger would not trigger Act 250. I think today. So we're Mr. really Chair, making, could, trying to make yeah. if we could understand if we could understand the concept of the entire trail regulation and what is being proposed, and we find that promising, we might go back and and ask ourselves how we might grandfather the various things that have already happened to fit the new model. So, but we're going to get the presentation on what the the big concept is here. Well, yeah. we talked about that. I know it's been a couple. It's been a couple weeks because I remember you. I, I I ran through sort of the, the 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 basis of what we hoped to come back to you with in, in December. But in in its in its simplest form, it's a it's a enhanced sort of best management practices um, system for managing all for managing all recreational trails with education and oversight. From agency okay, of uh, so agency and natural. Ready to hear it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think we're up to sub four. Okay. What? So have to wait, have I to have to more so questions. Oh. Uh, back to one. Um, yeah. For a new or proposed recreational trail that is or will be a part of the Vermont trail system. So I do not know at what point a trail is recognized as part of the Vermont trail system. So how can you, how, is it easy to determine what will be a part of the Vermont trail system and what happens if it doesn't receive that recognition? Uh, I, we added that in because historically way, the way trails have been brought into and approved as part of the Vermont trail system has been sort of after the fact, somebody has built a section of an area of trail and then sought approval. So what we tried to do was uh, be more forward looking and, and say if I, I, that I don't wanna build something unless I know I'm gonna be part of the Vermont trail system. So we wanted to make sure that we could deal with something that was proposed rather than built. So that's why that, that's why that language is in there. So, Somebody comes in and, and it says, I want to Commissioner Snyder and the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council. It says, I want to build X. Um, if I build it this way, I maintain it this way, um, can I be part, can I get approval to be bar, part of the Vermont Trail system? We wanted to be able to say, yes, go build it. And if you do, you're part of the Vermont Trail system. Historically, it's happened the other way where it's happened after the fact. And we thought we needed, that didn't, we wanted to be more proactive in, 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 in being able to include people as part of the system. I'm looking at Commissioner Snyder if he has anything to, to add to that. That's the reason for that language. Right, so I guess I'm just a little bit concerned because as we're adding this under this, this heading of the new definition of development are Vermont trail system trails. But now we're talking about things that are prospectively going to be trails but there is a potential that something can apply to be a, a recognized trail and not get that recognition. And maybe they decide not to build it then. I mean, that's sort of what I think they that think that's the, that's the, that's what we're trying to we're trying to have people want to be part of that, be part of that system. And if they're not going to be, then you know they may they may not build it, or they have to make adjustments so that it would get would get approved. I mean, the other thing, Ellen is is. The, the hope to get back to Senator McDonald's question is that this is temporary and in a year and a half or, you know, that this system basically gets shelved and we have a different system. So what we're talking about now basically becomes moot. What would the distance so system look it. like? What's the distance system that, and what would it look like? And if we endorse what is being proposed, then we can go back and grandfather and write the definitions necessary to get there. I still don't know what the system is yet. 
Well, again, we went over that. It's been a couple. It's been a couple couple of weeks. It's a, a long document, but but it was it was again in its core. It's a it's a set of best management practices that that set out clear standards for all different types of trail networks: hiking, biking, skiing, whatever whatever you know, uh, uh, ATVs, um, snowmobiles, and then our job is to basically enhance those BMPs to to address certain issues that we know they currently don't address. So that there's a there's a set of rules that everybody plays by, regardless of the length of the trail, the age of the trail, all of those things. Does that help? Let's hear it, Senator yeah. McDonald. You, you do have a um, you do have a memo which may be helpful yeah. to refer back to, which we can reorient you to maybe after. Okay, after and I will. I will that be... outlines a lot of it. Yeah. Um. Jamie, just for clarity, for instance, is that included in your June 4th memo to the committee? I'd have to go back and look at the date when um, Warren and Commissioner Snyder and I presented the memo. I don't have the date in front of me, but there was an overview memo. Right. Yeah, this was sometime back in May when I walked through, I walked through that, uh, the outline of that, of that memo. All right, so thank you. So which offline, can we ask you to yes. send it to the committee today because we're getting quite a collection of memos. Um, yep. Great. And again, we're, 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 that work is not finished yet. And so what we're doing here is trying to say, give us a little bit more time. We're gonna come back in December with hopefully the final package to present to you, Senator McDonald. Here's the work we've been doing. We still have a number of issues that we need to work through. But in the interim period of time, adopt these clarifying provisions in Act 250. That's that's the that's the framework. Make these clarifications. Give us some time. We'll come back with the whole thing, hopefully worked out, and then we can get into the details that I think you're interested in, Senator McDonald, which which is what we're interested in doing too. Okay. So we um, should keep in the interest Jack, I'm, I'm keep trying going. going quickly. Um, I do want to flag one thing on that yep. uh, question that um, uh, Ellen just mentioned, which was uh, a recreational trail that is or will be part of the trail system. If you don't, uh, the, the concern I would have just is that we not all get games. You know, someone could say, well, I am applying for that, but they really, it's not of a particular interest. It's not a necessarily a real goal, but it would allow them to come into this regulatory um, scheme that they would prefer to be under. So I just want to make sure that uh, someone who's not really genuinely interested in what you're proposing uh, doesn't get sort of abused by someone who says, well, I'd rather be regulated this way. In the end, I don't have any expectation I'll become part of the Vermont Trail System, but I'm going to, that's how I'm going to announce my project. Right. And I also think it's slightly uh, conflicts with the sort of opening threshold, which is this is for uh, improvements to these trails. And so if we, perhaps that language should be changed, because how do you know if you are a trail, if you haven't even necessarily gotten your recognition yet? Okay, so well, uh, so all good questions. And let's keep going. So we really understand your proposal and okay. complete proposal. Okay, so four uh, codifies existing practice in case law. This is the issue of uh, that basically the total acreage involved uh, depends on uh, ground disturbance and clearing that's going to occur. And if it's not, if there's ground isn't disturbed and it's not cleared, then it's not considered involved land. You don't use it in the calculation for determining acreage. That's that's again existing practice in in, in some of the uh, jurisdictional opinions in case law. Um, um, so this is also related to one of my concerns. Um, Currently under the definition of involved lands in the rules, the language is physically altered. And this mm -hmm. is introducing two new terms that aren't, that don't match that ground disturbance and clearing. And so they're, they're specific, but then they exclude from involved land, anything that won't be disturbed or cleared. And so I suspect that some of the things in three would not be part of, would not involve disturbance or cleared, or I, at the very least, I think it's ambiguous. So would the addition of picnic tables 
involve disturbance or kiosks or signage. Um, so I don't know if those two um, subdivisions line up. Well, we are trying to actually be broader because disturbance, uh, I think when I've read it really involved ground disturbance. And part of the issue was if you've got to clear actually trees to cut through, you know, to cut a new trail. So that's why we in, uh, used disturbance or cleared. We thought it actually captured, captured more. Most of the things I think listed in three would be picked up. Um, building restrooms, building a parking area, building a kiosk. Most of those, most of those would be. I don't think Act 250, uh, you know, putting a putting a sign in the ground. Uh, you know, I, we just tried to list everything that we wanted to be clear was related to a trail that could be could be part of that calculation. You're right. Is somebody sticking a sign in the ground? Disturbance? Probably not. Was is it going to count much towards jurisdiction? Probably not. Um, but we we actually thought the language was broader in four than what's currently in currently in, in in practice so that was the reason for the that was the reason for using those terms i don't know if, if matt or jamie want to chime in but that was the that was the idea we didn't think the other term captured potential tree clearing um, the last one five so this is designed to eliminate a potential you know a potential loophole uh, and what it, uh, what, so what I'll read it, what this does is so development and subdivision that requires a permit under another provision of this chapter shall include recreational trails for determining the amount of involved land related to that development, but shall not consider construction of improvements related to the trail as part of the review of the permit application. So what this, what this is designed of, and this is the example we used in the house was, um, Jamie wants to build a brewery uh, with retail seating and and uh, you know um, on-site on-site brewing, and as part of that, wants to offer uh, walking trails or mountain biking trails, and it's part of one it's part of one project. What we didn't want to uh, do is basically to for somebody to be able to exempt trails from the jurisdictional threshold from the rest of the of that uh, of of that project, so we so we basically said if you if it's if it's really part and this is not a scenario that I think has based on talking with Greg Bobel and others from the NRB that has um, uh, cropped up. Um, so so this is somewhat maybe uh, somewhat maybe theoretical, but basically we're wondering if, if it's if it's related to that as part of the project, then it's included for purposes of jurisdiction, but it's not included for the actual substantive. That's what that section is trying to say. So, do you have a question? Yeah. I find this language to be very confusing. Um, so, first, I'd like to highlight that it uses recreational trail and not Vermont uh, trail system trails. So, that makes it different from the rest of this subdivision. But then also, I'm confused about the word relates. Uh, particularly in the example you just gave, because I read this almost as like a penalty, because it sounds like a development that isn't a trail needs to count related trails in its involved land. So is a related trail a trail that crosses a property on which a brewery is going to be developed, but they aren't the same owners? Um, no, it sounds I, almost as though anything that builds near a trail and in some way that trail would be related to it would then have to count the trail towards their involved lands. No, the idea here was that you've got one one project um, that's that's standing together, not the scenario that quite frankly, that's the last thing we want is for somebody's project that happens to have a trail going by for, for that to conflate jurisdiction. This is a situation where there's a clear relationship, whether it's ownership, nexus that, again, Jamie comes in, builds a brewery, you know, five, five bikes brewery and offers three miles of mountain bike trail as a, a, part, a part of that common project. Again, I think your, your, your concern makes sense. It's not something that we've seen happen and we're certainly not trying to penalize somebody be, for being located next to a trail and have Act 250 asserted over their project because they're located in proximity to a trail. We're, it's, it's, quite the, it's quite the opposite what this is trying to do. Jamie, this is one you might want to speak to. 
No, I mean, I think if, if Alan, you may be making a good point that we may just need to clean up maybe some of the terms, um, you know, if there's any confusion with recreational trail versus the trails that are, are being contemplated for this, this provision, um, if we need to just tighten up the word relate. But I think Warren explained the, in, the intent well in that if it is a whole project, it's contemplated and planned as a whole project that has a recreational trails component, um, then for purposes of looking at the uh, commercial definition, you don't exclude uh, the trail. So it doesn't create a loophole for commercial development. I think that was the intent there is we're just trying to think forward and not allow unintended consequences of actually exempting more commercial development. Um, I think you, you maybe make a good point that there's a couple of terms here that could be tightened up, but we thought the concept made sense so as to not create a loophole. Um, you know, the, the other thing I just wanted, uh, in terms of being able to address these things, because we are ending up with a lot of pretty detailed questions as we work our way through, um, there's sort of a consortium here in the, the meeting that's done this work. So thank you for doing that. Uh, it's very helpful to have sort of a mature black and white work product to work our way through. Um, but Chair uh, Snelling from the NRB is on the call. And I'm just wondering if, if you have, we've been trying to raise questions, not necessarily to resolve them, but to flag them. If you have, uh, if you and Mr. Bobo also have questions, uh, if you wanna flag them or share observations while we're going through, that would probably be helpful too. And um, as opposed to asking you to do it all at the end in one fell swoop. I don't have any questions if that's the question, Senator. Okay, or uh, observations or <laughs> concerns. Uh, no, I don't have any concerns. I. Um, really uh, appreciate um, the opportunity to be here and just um, reflect to the committee. And, um, you know, I know you've heard a lot of testimony in the last few days, and um, I guess I've been trying to follow it as best I can. I'm not entirely up to speed. I, ha I don't know that I've had a chance to really um, look closely at this latest language, but it represents all the ideas that have been discussed now for quite some time. So it's not it's not anything new, right. exactly. And I guess um, uh, while I'm uh, grateful that the committee is able to take up these issues, I also hope um, that in, in the next session that you may get to some of the more um, sort of substantive issues around uh, the structure of the board itself, um, you know, uh, to, to try to put all these things in balance. Um, so that's really kind of where I would, uh, what I would like to say at this point in time. Okay. And when you say structure of the board, are we talking about the governance model provisions? Yes. Did yeah. not come over from the house. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. All right. So and Greg, I don't know if you had anything to add. Uh, good morning, Senator and committee. Um, I, I don't have anything to add, but um, if I, if I think it might be necessary to chime in, I, I'll do so. Okay. Great. So thank, thank you, you everyone. Uh, sure. Round table discussion is helpful for sorting, sorting out details. Um, with that, Mr. Coleman, I think we are up to the fourth instance of amendment here. Yep. That, and this one, um, this one's important. This one codifies existing rule 71 to, uh, make it clear to, to landowners that, uh, if there's, if there is jurisdiction over a trail, that it only extends to the trail and any of that infrastructure for operation of the trail it does not extend to the rest of the of the parcel. So if somebody's got again, somebody's got a section of trail that is subject to to 250. It's really that that trail section and any of those uh, uh, any of those other necessary infrastructure. It doesn't extend to to Mr. and Mrs. Jones's farmhouse and their barn and their crop fields and anything like that. It's that that's what this is. It's just taking that rule 71 and making it crystal clear. Um, Cause as you know, the, the system is, is largely cited on, on private landowner property. And we wanted to make this front and center and make it clear what the, uh, 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 what, what impact a, a trail had on 
uh, Act 250 jurisdiction with regard to the rest of the property. So that's that's that one's that's a pretty simple one. Right. Um, and is that still a sticking point for people? Although there is already Rule 71. Uh, and I think it's uh, we talked about this last time. Uh, I think the the issue is that um, we're just trying to we're we're trying to make it just crystal crystal clear. Uh, and and by putting it in statute, I think that I think that helps. Um, that's that's the idea. So it isn't an it is obviously an existing uh, existing rule, but um, it's definitely a different people have different views <laughs> on 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 Act 250 and 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 regulation. So we thought this could only help by making uh, making things more clear about how that works. Okay. Um, takes us to the fifth instance. Yep. So the the fifth is uh, keep that same uh, uh, sort of scenario in mind you've got a you've got a you know a, a, a large a large parcel someone allows a trail to be um corridor to be built and sited on their on their property um and that there is jurisdiction over that over that property if if that landowner needs to somehow build a driveway or an access road to a farm field or whatever it might be they need to actually cross that uh that trail that just crossing that trail and having to do that does not require them to go get a permit or a permit amendment. That's that's what's that's what's behind this. It's again another scenario that, quite frankly, we heard. At least my group, the Vermont Trail Alliance, heard from landowners. Was am I going to have to go get a permit amendment or a permit um, if I need to cross that uh, cross that recreational trail? And we said no. So long as what you're doing isn't obviously related to the to the trail. So that's that's the clarification that's designed to make. It's really about access to somebody's parcel where you need to cross cross the trail. And then the last uh, the last section is um, uh, in the seventh instance. Their amendment is uh, that's the report, that's the directive to the to agency and natural resources uh, to come back to the committees of jurisdiction in uh, in December uh, with a. A program, legislative recommendations for a BMP-driven program for the Vermont Trail System Trails, uh, and it obviously lists there the things that we are supposed to sort of the nature of the program, the things that are supposed to be considered, um, and uh, the folks that we are supposed to uh, to reach out and and work with to finish that work. And that's not a lot of time. We're pretty far along in the process, um, but we need to roll up our sleeves and try and get this. Uh, across the finish line. So that's that's what that's designed to do. Um, and the last piece um, here, this is the sunset. If you look at it uh, under effective dates, that um, that second uh, that second that B right there has the sunset for January 1, 2022. That ties back to earlier when we were trying to create that sort of standalone standalone section. Um, so that those clarifying provisions uh, would uh, would sunset on January 1, 2022. Okay. Um, sub A, is that the way 926 was passed? Uh, all of this is the way yes. 926 was passed. Okay. So those, for example, so would include the definitions, like the definitions of trails is not something that would be sunset. That's not something that's in that section. Just to draw your draw the distinction there. So and obviously, it, 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 there's a lot of, there's a lot of other parts of the bill. The whole rest of the the whole rest of the bill um, at nine twenty six takes effect on passage there or so September one twenty. Basic plan is the working group comes back at the end of the year with recommendations to the legislature. We have an entire legislative session to do additional work, but meanwhile, you've carved out roughly 18 months under this pilot, whatever we want to call it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, I'm looking around to see if anyone wants to uh, uh, ask any questions bef before we drill down a little further on the, on the proposal. And Senator Bray, just to just to, uh, I do want to address that other 
that other uh, addition to, to this whenever you think it's appropriate? Um, sure. Well, let's let's pick it up while we're here too. So uh, Mr. Coleman had sent along another section of language that was elsewhere in the bill, just flagging it so it might not be left behind. Right. So what I sent last uh, last Friday, it's under my name. It's one uh, it's one page, um, and what it is would be an addition. Um, so. One of the concerns that's arisen as we've been working on uh, working on this is there have been um, a couple requests of the NRB for, or I should say, the district commissions to determine whether there's jurisdiction over certain um, trail projects. And we talked about the status of those uh, last uh, last week, and I can revisit that if you like. But there are dozens and dozens of Vermont trail system trails out there that are currently not under Act 250 jurisdiction. Uh, and what, what this proposal does is says for this 18 month period that we've already identified, that if you're part of the Vermont trail system uh, trail and your trail exists as of July 1st, 2020, Act 250 jurisdiction is not gonna apply. And the reason we did it that way is basically what we're, what we're concerned about is um, having people make jurisdictional opinion requests uh, for trail networks you know, anywhere in the state for whatever reason they might do that. And you can recall that anyone can make a request for a jurisdictional opinion with good intention or, or, or otherwise. And we didn't want uh, people to sort of take their eye off the ball and finish work on this program and instead spend time and money and quite frankly, paying attorneys, no offense uh, intended to some of my colleagues out there in the, the, legal, uh, the legal world, um, working with the district commissions to try and recreate history and figure out whether Act 250 should have applied for work that was done you know, years or, or decades ago. We just didn't think that was a, uh, a good use of time. And quite frankly, um, we wanted to at least call a, a, a timeout on the ability to do that. So this was the suggestion of the way to to, uh, to do that is basically to say that no permits required for Vermont Trail System Trail uh, uh, in existence prior to July, 2021, and then add to the sunset date, add, this, add that same piece to the uh, sunset provision. So that would also go away uh, in January 1, 2022. And the, you, the phrase in there uh, required of a Vermont Trail System Trail pursuant to section 443. So pursuant to section 443 brings in what, please? That, that, is, uh, that is where you are designated to be part of the Vermont Trail System Trail. Um, that's that Vermont Trail System Trail uh, chapter. So that's, it's just, it's adding language that you're a Vermont Trail System Trail pursuant to that section. That's, that's where you get such designation. It was just Thank trying you. to be thorough in identifying how you get that identification. Senator um, I understand the concept of Act 250 will not apply. Does that mean that what has been built is grandfathered? Or does it mean now that it's been built in the next 18 months, you can rearrange or do stuff to it for the next 18 months? Where it's closer to your first one, but that, but that grandfathering is for a limited window of time. It basically says that, says that, that Senator McDonald, you can't go ask for a jurisdictional opinion in a project in Shrewsbury that you've never been to. Um, and uh, and th that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to put a, it's just trying to put a temporary timeout on, on the, the potential for jurisdictional opinions. Um, we've had experience with uh, with okay. a couple, okay. and I think okay. and and okay. in following this timeout period, when the next thing is triggered, all things will be will be subject to the same regulation, um, and the stuff that's been yeah. grandfathered and might not be permitted in the future doesn't have to be dismantled. Right? I think that's the idea. Is we want everybody to play by the same by the same set of uh, uh, by the same set of rules have the same benefits um, of, okay. of, of hopefully oversight education resources sounds, sounds like a plan 
Okay. Um, does this, uh, I don't know, some people were calling it a moratorium on jurisdictional opinions. Um, you've artfully avoided the word moratorium so far. The, uh, but the, the, no, seriously, so there's a vesting of rights that comes along with in this process. So at what point, to, following up on Senator McDonald's question, if someone does something in the next 18 months under this pilot, whether it's a new construction or modifications to an existing trail system, um, have we in essence said, okay, your rights were vested in that 18 month period and no subsequent legislation will impact what you've built during that time period. And, and then the question will become, will we perhaps have some unintended consequences or regrets that things happened that were unexpected or problematic, but now we've legally uh, walled them off from, from uh, other review. So I don't know, Warren, if you, if you don't mind, I just I'll step in on this one. Um, sure. I think with respect to um, the, the concept of vesting rights, Senator, you know, a person, I think that the group is actively looking at how uh, trails will be maintained and, and, and operated going forward into the future. And I don't think it precludes uh, an outcome where when there are substantial improvements or upgrades to a trail that they need to be brought up to whatever new standard is being contemplated as, as far as this. So a person doesn't have a, a, vest, a quote unquote vested right in, to operate in non-compliance with the regulatory structure. I, I think there's a practical consideration around whether we as either ANR or the legislature make people um, go back and retrofit existing trails so that they meet the, the new standards or whether we come up with a set of standards that acknowledges that things are in existence, but we, we push them forward to the most protective, protective standard we possibly can as we go through this. Senator McDowell? Um, I think Mr. Chapman just spoke to what would happen at the end of the 18 months. I'm trying to understand what happens during the 18 months. What can I get away with? What can I do? What can you not tell me I can't do? Who will, what is the consequence if I do some of the things that my wildest dreams on my property, I might think of doing? What happens during those 18 months? Well, let's, let, let's be clear, Senator McDonald, there's ultimately very few trail projects that currently uh, are overseen or, or, or trigger Act 250 jurisdiction for whatever, for whatever reason, but that's just the facts on the ground. There's, there's very few projects that actually get looked at through Act, through Act 250 right now. So all we're, 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 trying to, we're trying to maintain the status quo, but with this 18 month period to provide some, some much needed clarity on, on uh, on, on, various, on various things. So the idea is, is, is not that this is creating some, some uh, free for all or, or, or anything that's gonna happen in that, in that period. I think, I think quite, to the, quite to the contrary. Um, I don't think uh, that, that's, 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 the, that's the idea here. Well, if there's an 18 month period, which is gonna be different from the 1st of July to when it's over and then after it's over, it's gonna be different again, so. Well, this, this interim will, period is not really very different than what currently exists. Again, most of these provisions are in rule or in cases or in, in, in practice right now. We're trying to bring them forward under one, uh, under, under one section. I mean, that's largely what this is doing. This is not making wholesale changes I, to existing act practice. I think it's the, op I think it's the, the opposite. So we're trying to basically hold the status quo, clarify things, let us finish our work, and then create something different. We're not trying to create a third, you know, three things. We're trying to we're trying to basically create two. And and there's to be honest, there's not going to be an awful lot of work done this year, given given what's uh, given what's going on. 
Most of the trail construction is very incremental because it's volunteer driven, very limited resources. And Senator and Bray, if, if we'll be all right, you we'll may or may not be correct with that prediction. Thank you. <laughs> Having worked with the trail organizations, I'm, I'm making what I believe is, is an honest uh, assessment of what I think is going to happen, okay. and I think okay. other groups as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, you're welcome. Uh, Jamie, you had something you wanted to chip in? Yeah, just, just for full transparency, just wanted to share that th this is a, a proposal from the Vermont Trails Alliance, and I've been representing the, the Forest Partnership. Um, and um, so th this is not, this is separate from the package of work that we've done together with, with VTA and, and the administration. Um, and and our, pos our position on this is that uh, we're neutral on this. I think we uh, as we've been developing the the alternative program, we've all talked about the concept that if trails are out of compliance, that they should come into compliance with the the best management practices and 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 the oversight that would be part of the new program. So I think it was anticipated moving forward if the alternative program comes into place that there would be a way to address the issues on the ground. Um, we do understand that, um, or I guess it's our hope that as many resources as possible could be put into creating the alternative program. Um, so we do, I guess, understand why the trail groups are asking for this. Um, we also do want to recognize it's an unusual, um, it's an unusual request. We do believe that the Natural Resources Board has um, does have authority to. Um, exercise discretion to address pending issues that are related to trail jurisdiction while the A&R program is being developed. Um, but our position on this is that we're, we're neutral on this. And we understand that, um, you know, the committee will, will consider this issue. And we remain very focused on the overall development of the alternative program as an overall solution to these jurisdictional issues that have been coming up. Okay. So is there a way that these things can be melded together? Like during the pilot phase, you would continue the work that would develop the alternative program? Or do you see one as, is this a fork in the road or can these things happen in parallel? Does it actually buy you time to develop, uh, specify and maybe fund the alternative program? That's that's the idea, Senator, and that's why we've that's why we've selected this this time frame of of, of sunsetting all this on July uh, January first, twenty twenty two, is because we anticipate that the new program is going to require some legislative action, um, and we we would anticipate there was going to be some work that A and R or FPR has to do uh, in conjunction with us, probably primarily around uh, uh, the best management practices development. Uh, and getting that all in place. So that's exactly what we've tried to do is, is create stability for 18 months. So everyone knows what the current rules of the road are. That's basically what we're doing is saying, codifying the sort of the existing rules of the road and giving us the time to finish that up and then make that, uh, uh, and, and hopefully make that transition. That's, that's exactly why we did it this way. Okay, so now I'm looking at team a and which there are three members here today and say, uh, is the agency supportive of this approach if it's coupled with uh, support for the developing the alternative program? I'll speak to that. Senator Bray, thank you. Commissioner Snyder, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of FPR for the record. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, we're so, very, we're yeah. very grateful for the work that's been done, reflecting broad input over several years, and uh, appreciate the conversation, identifying clarifications here. But uh, yes, very much in support of what came through 926, and we are also in support uh, beyond neutrality to the uh, the idea of clarifying a, a pause on the jurisdictional opinions for this interim period. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Warren, I'm going to ask you to take on a difficult task. That is, where could this go wrong? 
you know, is there something we're not, if we, when you carve out a pilot that is in a certain way more permissive, right? Not in any negative sense, but is there anything in here where you say, well, we are leaving ourselves a little bit open to X, Y, or Z as an unintended consequence. Is there anything that you concerned at all about? Not, not in anything that we've worked on together and developed. Again, I, I think of, I don't think of this as a pilot. I think of this as a, as a clarification to give us the time to finish our work. I don't think it changes anything. You know, if you're Vermont Trail System Trail, you have a, you're, you've got a 10 acre uh, jurisdictional threshold for triggering Act 250. That's not, that's not changing. So we're, we're I, again, we're, we're pulling from existing practice and law and, and, and rule and cases and putting it all in one, putting it all in one place. I don't think, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize this as a, as a pilot because that suggests we're doing something out of the ordinary. And I think we're doing something that's, that's uh, it designed to be, designed to basically be the, the, the status quo. Okay, great. So then I think, let me ask the committee, um, are people feeling comfortable enough with a proposal that we would ask our council to uh, take this language and start to put it into the draft amendment we have. And then I think we would wanna revisit how it relates to the um, alternative program that Commissioner Snyder and others have articulated so that it's one coherent um, proposal in our amendment. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Mr. Kowski, does that seem like a quote unquote straightforward enough request? Uh, yes, but I have a few other concerns of the language. I think broadly that this language introduces a, a bunch of new terms that are not currently in Act 250. Um, I also am concerned specifically about the word necessary that is referenced in a few of the subdivisions. And so I think on one hand, there is a lot of information in this proposal that is a restatement of existing law and practice. Right. However, there are new terms that don't match that existing law and practice, as well as these sort of carve outs related to uh, elements in existence uh, on or before July 1. And so I'm, I think that those are open to multiple interpretations, but also leads to potentially um, bifurcation of trails. So if a, if a trail has elements that are inexistent prior to July 1, 2020, they do not count as part of involved land here. Um, so that's potentially breaking the trail into two pieces. Um, if only the new things are going to be um, involved land moving forward. And so does that mean that the trail is not actually going to reach the threshold of involved land, even though we have two segments that would even though they're connected. Um, I'm, I'm still confused. And so I can attempt to redraft it, but I am still finding a lot of it to be open to multiple interpretations. Okay. Well, so that seems like a major question. Maybe be, uh, before we go on, um, can someone, can Warren or someone else respond to that, please? I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to understand the question. I mean, we, we certainly are for this interim period, basically saying for a Vermont trail system trail, the threshold is 10 acres going forward period. You're not looking back to see what it connected to for purposes of saying that prior section of trail that was built 10 years ago, uh, that you add that length of trail to the section that you're that you're proposing. That is one of the areas of greatest confusion um, that we're trying to make a very clear statement right now. I mean, trails are supposed to connect to other trails. That's the idea. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we've, we had a jurisdictional opinion in 2017 that didn't find jurisdiction because the segment that was being built uh, wasn't long enough, but it said, you gotta keep track because it could trigger it sometime in the forward, in, in, in the future. And if there's other things that are that are built, that could that could pull it in. So, we're for for this period of time, we're trying to be very clear that we're we're not gonna we're 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 not going to be looking backwards uh, for for this next 18 months. So that that I think is one thing that we try to be crystal clear on. Hope and 
that maybe that so I don't think it's a I don't think it's a fork um, but I think a, a fork in the road I think it's just trying to basically be clear that we're we're trying to do away with that uncertainty of what's happened in the past if you're building something now or in the future I don't know if Matt or Jamie want to add to that but that was that was the idea here so then do those things before July 1 do not require a permit or don't require a permit under this new section. Um, well, because I feel like subdivision two and three yeah. don't line up exactly. So it shall apply to construction um, made on or after July 1, 2020, but involved land doesn't include those. So whatever is in existence will not be part of this analysis, even as involved land. So does any part of the jurisdiction attach to those things or just, and they never have to get a permit or do they have to get a permit under a different section of Act 250 development jurisdiction? Well, if somebody builds it again, if somebody's building something that's not, this is just solely for trails. So I guess I'm not, maybe we can take this offline. So I guess I'm not quite I understanding the question that you're asking and I'm, I'm looking at, to see if Matt is getting a better read on what on on what you're asking. So this subdivision shall not apply to construction of improvements made on or after uh, July this uh, July one, but then for purposes of involved land involved land does not include any recreational trail constructed before July 1. So we're picking this time of July 1, 2020. And so things built before that are not involved land. And this subdivision shall only apply to things that are after. So what happens to those things that were constructed before July 1, 2020? They, they don't have to go through any analysis of the Act 250 jurisdiction. They're completely exempt from Act 250 jurisdiction. During this interim period, they don't they wouldn't count towards you determining whether it, it, you, you're not adding them, you know, you're not. So if, if somebody built a section of trail 10 years ago and it's three miles long and you come in and you're proposing to add on to that, we're not going to look at that three mile section for purposes today of this project for this period going forward. You're not, you're not going to look at them cumulatively. That's, that's, that's basically what this is saying for this period of time, period. And so, and if I may, I'm sorry for interrupting because I, I, I think that the proposed language that's not part of the bill that passed out of the House that I think Warren was discussing earlier, subsection Z, might address some of the questions, Ellen, that I think you're having with respect to any Vermont trail system trail that was built prior to July 1, 2020 does not need right. A permit, and that, and that, and that, and the proposal is that that will sunset as well in eighteen months. Right. So I, I think that may address your question, though I'm not entirely certain. That's right, Greg. I had forgotten at that, you know, that that additional piece basically just puts a temporary freeze on Act Two Hundred and Fifty jurisdiction for stuff that's that's in existence now. This proposal right now talks about jurisdiction from this period going forward. So it's, I think it covers both. One important clarification I, I would ask is, um, and I have to ask you, Warren, I, I don't, uh, I, I would hope that the intent here is not to say that if you're under Act 250 jurisdiction that this somehow then um, eliminates the requirement to stay in compliance with Act no. 250. No. And I don't know if a clarification is needed if the committee decides there's, to support this. I, there's certainly nothing in here that's talking about erasing erasing Act 250 uh, jurisdiction when it's already been asserted. This is talking about um, this is talking about if it if it hasn't. Right, but I think the language that, that you've offered in regards to what Senator Bray was referring to as a, as a moratorium, I, I could read it and see it as suggesting no permit is required. So I would just hope that it doesn't eliminate existing permits. Or amendment jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, we could we, we could make that clarification, but that certainly was not not the intent. And I think when we've looked at, yeah, I mean, we can we could certainly clarify that that if, if there's an existing Act 250 permit in place for a trail, this isn't all of a sudden saying, guess what, you don't need a permit now. Um, it wouldn't make sense to do that for eighteen, you know, for eighteen months or whatever. But I understand your point. But I think we can clarify that. But that's certainly not the intent. 
So it's a situation so, where there is no jurisdiction and somebody now comes in and asks the question of whether it should apply. Okay, um, we're almost there, Sam McDonald. Um, maybe this is my ignorance of the current law, but trails cover all sorts of different activities from cross country skiing, walking, horseback, bicycle, motorcycles, right. snowmobiles, ATVs, the six, the three axle ATVs that are getting to look like pickup trucks and then um, um, you know, off-road pickup trucks. Um, can any of these trails be upgraded or, um, or have their use changed during this 18 months or is that all covered in your proposal? I guess I'm, th I'm thinking, I mean, we don't typically have, uh, we tell we have the uh, ATV trails have their own network and they're usually not shared. Those are usually not shared, uh, shared trail systems. So I think that's highly, highly un un unlikely. Uh, I can't think of a situation where we've had an ATV trail that's been, that's something that allows ATVs that's been a conversion from say a hiking or a, or a, or a mountain biking trail. I think they have, they have their own they have their own designated system. Okay, but then that's my ignorance and I. Okay. okay. Thanks for the question. All right. So then I think I would ask uh, uh, Ms. Chakowsky to start drafting, uh, bringing this language, and then write an accompanying memo that outlines the open issues you still see, and then that'll help us as a committee and a working group here to, to see what's still a little unclear or, you know, introduction of new terms can be a bugaboo. It's like why <laughs> definitions count for a lot. Um, so we all, we're talking about the same things in the same way in different places. Uh, and, and Senator Bray, obviously our group here, Matt, Jamie, I, Greg, are I'm sure happy to work with Ellen to try and make that go uh, quickly, and I try and understand what the what the uh, what the questions are. Great. Well, uh, and just to be thank you for that. And if we can, it'd be great if we could revisit this uh, and get sort of a progress report update tomorrow, because we're going to be aiming to start closing in on an amendment by Friday. Uh, which, to be honest, I suspect we'll have some loose ends that will require additional work over the weekend or maybe Monday, but um, then the ship will have sailed. So we need, we need to be on it. Um, one, so thank you. I, I have one question around the BMPs that are the, uh, being discussed. Uh, are they in, have they been drafted? Are they in a, in a process of being drafted? Um, how is that process working? And um, if you could just fill us in how, on how these two pieces are going to fit together over time. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I know and then I might turn it over actually to Commissioner uh, Snyder since he's very familiar with all of them. But, but all, the different, all the different Vermont trail system trails currently have best management practices, you know, and they're, they're largely manuals and they're, they are specific and relevant to their type of, uh, type of trail activity. Some of them are, are um, forest, you know, U.S. Uh, uh, forest parks um, uh, manuals, the, the mountain bike mamba, uh, manual that VIMBA uses um, is, is, is a, a, a national level uh, manual. So they all have specific uh, manuals, BMPs, uh, that, that they're required to uh, adhere to. What we're talking about is what we would add um, to them sort of across the across the board to make sure some of the Vermont specific issues are are addressed things that are not probably addressed in some of those uh, in some of those documents or things that need to be sort of Vermontized for lack of a better uh, lack of a better word so there's that that's 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 the step is we have a we have a very solid base to start from we're not completely reinventing the wheel we're trying to figure out what we need to do to add to those things to make sure that the issues that our groups have flagged collectively are uh, are addressed. I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to 
to add to that, but that's that's how I would summarize that. We're 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 not starting from scratch. Uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Warren, yeah. I think you had, you covered that well. That's exactly it. They have these very use specific guidance that's uh, that are tend to be nationally generated, as you say, and in in in, in some cases internationally generated uh, and well applied. They are unique and specific to those, and they don't necessarily grasp some of the other attendant issues that I think we're all concerned about or should be. And so we would envision, uh, you know, that kind of process as Warren describes of vermontizing them and expanding them to be uh, all encompassing of the, the values and, and uh, features on the landscape that we want to protect. So um, just to make sure I understand, Commissioner Snyder, when you say that the vermontizing piece would be, for instance, looking at things like impacts on water quality, uh, habitat, corridors, fragmentation, all those, I guess I would just call them em environmental criteria. Right, and I think they would, certainly, and that's the, 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 the brunt of it, but I think we're also aware that we want to make sure, as, as may be appropriate, that they cover uh, attendant impacts and issues, things like traffic, uh, parking, human waste, that might also be needed for the planning of a trail and its use. So we want to just make sure they are appropriately uh, uh, encompassing all of those beyond the, the very typical environmental features that you reference uh, and go beyond the trail itself, but maybe to consider the impacts of trail use. They tend to be about how wide, at what, at what pitch or grade, where do the water bars go? Well, there's also impacts on the surrounding flora and fauna, and we want to make sure that these are robust for those impacts as well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chapman, did you have something? I mean, I think the only thing that I would add to what Commissioner Snyder said, and, and just sort of on behalf of um, Commissioner Porter is, is, I mean, I do think we all have to acknowledge that this is going to take uh, some significant level of staff resources, both in the development of these and the implementation of them. And so we kind of need to be cognizant as, as this moves forward, the, the impacts that it's gonna take. And, and I think that's one of the challenges that we face as an agency in trying to um, both develop a, a set of, of BMPs that can be implemented, but also um, moving forward to actually to administer them themselves. Sure. So there's a uh, is there an there's an appropriation component or no? No, and I, I appreciate Matt saying that it's not just for Commissioner Porter. Uh, that right. is a that is an extant problem right now. This would be as it's been envisioned would come more to us. Uh, we can't do this. I don't want to do this without Fish and Wildlife. We need their expertise. So it is. We're all in, and I flagged that for the committee before. You know, regretfully, yeah, there's so much positivity here having to flag that, you know, we are going to need capacity, added capacity and resources. All the stakeholders have heard this. They know it. They've embraced it. I appreciate Matt raising it. It is another piece. I was simply responding to the specific nature of the question about the BMPs themselves. But to implement all of this, to build it and then implement it, yes, it will require. And none of that is in the legislation now. Uh, it, it, we'd have to get to that. Okay. And then my last question, I think, is... Uh... Actually, I'm sure it's not my last question. Um, a, another question is, um, during this 18 months where we're operating under sort of a clarified set of definitions, not a pilot, um, are we in any, uh, are we in jeopardy of encouraging development that won't have, uh, because it's officially excluded from Act 250, that those questions the, that we were just discussing around uh, habitat and flora and fauna, et cetera, are we somehow, not, are we leaving a process open to not looking at those things because we've just officially stepped out of Act 250? So who's, who will address those under what rubric if we go ahead and say, you're not in Act 250, go ahead and keep working on trails. I can take a crack at one aspect of this, Senator, if, um, if you wish. I would just say that for those, this is, I think as, the, as Warren and others explained earlier, this is about uh, the, the, the pause would be on, in, in this very, that it's not saying it really anything more about jurisdiction. It's, it's that we're just not gonna allow someone to call the question. Uh, and during that time, 
if this, in as much as this is about trails that are in the Vermont trail system, that is part of the trail system designation is meeting certain criteria for environmental protection. And so I guess that would fall to us in the interim to, to still do that role of saying, well, wait a minute, now you're, you've done, you've gone crazy here and this doesn't meet the standards of the trail system. So there would be at least that as some level of backstop it's, um, during that pause. That's, that's an attempt to explain at least our piece of a role in maintaining best practice out there in the interim. Okay, well, I think, uh, you know, I think the committee has always been interested in facilitating the growth of the recreation industry as it relates to trails. Uh, I've never, uh, heard, well, seeing Senator McDonald shake and said, in general, I would say people have said, this is a, a good industry for Vermont, a good fit, et cetera. How do we do it well? I mean, that is always really what I've heard people say. How do we do it well? And now we're, we're trying to make our way through it. If we're gonna clarify and say, Active 250 for the next 18 months is not part of how we do it well, then I just wanna make sure that we're not also, uh, that we're, we're not excluding tools that we already use to help ourselves do it well, uh, no matter Senator how Ray, one, we are. One thing to remember is that, um, uh, well, one, I, I don't think it really is gonna, I don't really don't think it changes what's sort of ultimately really what's in and what's out very much during this interim period. The other thing is, if somebody's building a trail and even if it's not Act 250 jurisdictional trail, if they need to get a wetlands permit, they still need to get a wetlands permit. If they need to, you know, any of the a agent, any of the a &R permits that are currently required are still gonna be required. So if somebody needs to do a stream crossing and wants to put a bridge in uh, or needs to put culverts in or any of that work, a &R permits are still applicable. There's no, there's no time out on, it, on any of that work. And the trail groups currently are required to get those. They currently obtain those. That, 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 is, that remains true. Thanks for that, Warren. It's really important. And, and that's indeed part of the criteria for inclusion and eligibility inclusion in the trail system would be they're open to the public, they're non-commercial, and they have all the permits in place for environmental protection and, and whatever else might apply. That's, that's part of it, gaining that designation and the favorable treatment associated with it. Okay, thank you. That's a helpful clarification and reminder for me. Um, all right, so then um, if you all will work with Ms. Tchaikovsky, we'll look at getting a, a language prepared for being included in an amendment. Um, so thank you everyone. So we're gonna change channels a little bit, although we're staying, we're, we're not out of the woods yet, huh, sorry. And uh, yesterday in talking about the road rule um, and forest block protection and uh, habitat corridor, corridor um, we were, we, we had a, discussion about that. And um, one of the things that came up was, well, so I'll leave, there was a question about how well all those things fit together in terms of uh, 926's proposals as they address force blocks, habitat corridors, uh, using uh, the road rule as a jurisdictional trigger. Um, and so uh, we asked, <laughs> He's just fled his screen. Uh, 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 Charlie Hancock uh, to join us this morning. He's been working with the committee in the past. And um, so I wanted to ask him for some thoughts on that construct for, from his experience uh, as a forester. And here he comes. Good morning, uh, Mr. Hancock. Thanks for joining us again. Hey, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> of course, of course, someone knocks on the door right at the right time, right? Yeah, that's my dog. Um, yeah, well, the dog was also going off. So yeah, he's our uh, alarm system. Um, so uh, sorry I missed your introduction, um, but thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to talk with you all today about some of the provisions in H926, specifically around the road rule and forest fragmentation. Um, so for the record, uh, my name is Charlie Hancock. I'm a consulting forester. I, uh, I work with landowners all across the northern tier of the state. 
um, helping them with um, forest management plans, implementing timber sales, conservation designs, things like that. Um, I'm also the chairman of the Montgomery Select Board. I've served in that role for about six years. And prior to that, I was uh, I served for about six years on Montgomery's Planning Commission. So today I'd kind of like to speak with all three of those hats on from those different perspectives. Hey, um, I think you've been in our committee when we had, uh, didn't you do a large, didn't your town do a large force block uh, purchase and protection? program um, recently we so our, our town has not done a specific large project um yet i think we have we have a number that i'd like to see get off the ground i oh. think uh, i think the project i was uh, in your committee on was the one in westford all right um, thank that, you that was the one that um i remember senator mcdonald was really impressed with the stone walls on that project <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah okay um so thank you uh yeah, so I didn't want to interrupt. Here we go. No, nope, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so um, you know, in, in looking through uh, the bill, um, there's kind of a three-pronged approach that kind of is developing that I, I really think is is fantastic. Um, you know, there's a there's a portion of it that looks at supporting um, growth in our village centers and our downtowns. Um, you know, I totally support those exemptions. Montgomery is looking at launching a pretty ambitious wastewater and streetscape project to kind of catalyze and, and launch us into the next 50 years in our community to support that kind of growth. And so those exemptions in those places will really kind of help um, catalyze that effort and make that happen. Um, I also really enthusiastically support the provisions in the bill around the forest products industry. You know, a lot of these might seem kind of like small things to people who don't work in this industry, but they can have an outsized impact. Um, in an industry that's you know it's already struggling, let alone what happened with COVID. Um, so these these small tweaks, relatively small tweaks, can have a big impact there. Um, and then lastly, I'm I'm really excited to see the provisions in the bill that address the scattered, high impact rural residential development that we're seeing around the state. Um, so I think that you know these three three areas taken together. Um, really provide a critical balance, you know, balancing rural economic development, supporting the forest products industry, and protecting the resource values that are associated with these forest blocks and connectivity areas. I think that to do just one of these uh, focal areas at the exclusion of another, rather than advancing them all as a whole package, would really kind of do a disservice and not achieve the ends that we need to keep these communities and this industry and this resource really viable for the future of Vermont. So. Um, again, I'm excited to see the whole the whole package move forward. Um, now, specifically to the provisions to address the scattered, you know, high impact rural residential development that we've been seeing, you know, I think the revised road rule that's in this bill does exactly that. Um, in, in hindsight, when we lost the old road rule back in the early 2000s, I think it was a mistake. Um, there were certainly loopholes in that, you know, things around driveways and provisions there, but we, we really lost a critical safeguard for development in these areas, which is not addressed in the existing criteria, you know, specifically looking at 8A. Um, and, uh, and that safeguard is really important. You know, I can, I can point to a project right here in Montgomery that uh, almost coincided the development right with the road rule going away, um, ironically enough. Um, but it involves a 200 acre parcel off of Route 242 that abuts the Jay State Forest and is kind of centered right in one of the highest value forest blocks in our area, which is also one of the highest uh, value connectivity zones that's identified here. You know, that project um, started off with a nine lot subdivision that over time increased to a 16 lot subdivision and doing so in a way where it didn't trigger any of the provisions that exist in Act 250 today. Um, so what we're left with now is a um, 200 acre parcel that is now 16, 12 acre lots. Um, not only does that completely take away the functionality of that 200 acre parcel to support the resource concerns that we've got around wildlife habitat and ecological concerns, but also the ability to support um, working forests and the ability for the industry to, to have that as part of the land base that it works on. Um, it also has ancillary impacts that spread out from that 200 acre parcel. You know, the area around it has been impacted greatly as far as the functionality of wildlife habitat and the connectivity through there. 
So um, there are projects that are happening. We can point to them. Um, they are creating the impacts that we want to deter and not see happen on our landscape. And they're gonna increase. I mean, Montgomery saw about a 21% increase in our population between 2000 and 2010. And the projections um, that they're looking at out of this coming census that we're in now um, show potential for another almost 17% increase. We'll see if that pans out. But if um, the current real estate trends are, you know, anything like a, like a weather vane that we can look at, um, we're going to see growth. And, and I think we're going to see more of it as a result of what we're looking at now in the world today. Talking with um, real estate agents that work in the community, they are slammed right now with people from all over the country calling about purchasing homes, primarily second homes, but with the implicit desire to potentially eventually move here. Um, so we're, we're already seeing an influx of development that's only going to be exacerbated, I think, from you know, the, what the world's facing today. So this is a, a real problem, and we have a chance to kind of you know, do some real work to address it. Um, you know, the towns of Montgomery, as well as our neighbors, Enosburg, and in, in Enosburg have done a lot of work to incorporate the, what was the old road rule into our own zoning provisions. Um, Enosburg actually has a provision which essentially mirrors the old road rule, whereas Montgomery used the old road rule as a means of establishing district boundaries between rural residential and our conservation districts. Um, and we've seen really great success with that. Um, it has not stopped development or stymied development. What it's done is it's allowed development to occur in a smart way, which is exactly what we want to see on the landscape. So even without the existing road rule in Act 250, communities like ours, like Enosburg's, we're already doing some of this um, and in using those tools to achieve the ends that we want. So I think seeing this replicated across the straight, uh, state through revisions to Act 250 would be a huge step in, uh, in limiting this sort of fragmentation. Um, and you know, this revised road rule is, it's a much narrower, narrower jurisdictional trigger than things that we've con uh, previously considered. You know, back when H233 was before the committee, I testified on a number of points there. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that, um, that developments could be designed in a way to avoid this rule and minimize fragmentation impacts. Again, it's not like it's just gonna totally do away with all development. What it's gonna do is ensure, again, that development is done in a smart and thoughtful way. Um, and you know, this isn't just my opinion, it's an opinion that's shared by a host of other consulting foresters that work in the state. Back in 2018, when H233 was before both chambers, we submitted a letter that was signed by uh, over 20 other licensed foresters in the state in support of the um, criteria that would um, address forest fragmentation. So this isn't just an issue that I'm seeing here in Montgomery or in the communities and, and landscapes that I work with, but it's one that's being seen across the state from Southern areas to central to up here in the North and the Northeast Kingdom. Um, lastly, if I could just briefly touch on um, some of the parts of the bill that deal with rulemaking around criteria and specifically around resource mapping. Um, I understand that there's a lot of trepidation around using resource mapping as, as a tool here. Um, and, I, and I've talked to folks like Eric Sorensen, um, who developed uh, the tools like Vermont Conservation Design, and I understand the concerns there, but I do think that there, there is a way where we can use this tool to help develop this criteria and in this rulemaking process. And I really think that to not use that as a tool would be kind of a disservice to this whole enterprise. Um, I understand the trepidation, I think we can do it smartly, but to not do it would, would be taking a tool that provides so much um, capacity and use and information that uh, we, we can't turn our backs on it. You know, science is informing our everyday lives. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation on Zoom right now is a result of us listening to scientists, listening to scientists and putting into place public policy. So um, I would strongly encourage that we don't kind of shy away from using things like Vermont conservation design and addressing um, rulemaking and criteria. Okay. Um, so with that, those are those are briefly just the comments and high points that I wanted to illustrate. Okay. So thank you. Right. And so the committee looked at the the maps. Probably last visit with them was maybe two years ago. Could you just say a, a little bit about them and how they might be woven into a rulemaking process, and from your perspective? 
Um, yeah, so I think I think the how they're woven into a rulemaking process is probably a little above my pay grade, <laughs> but I think that the value of them is extremely important. And, and if, if any of the committee members or folks on the call have not dug into Vermont conservation design, I would encourage you to do so and, and look at more than just the maps themselves, because they really do kind of act as a as a layered resource as we look at our landscape and the and the resources and features that are important to us. And, and call out where it is that we want to protect. Because um, one of the questions that we get about things like forest blocks is, well, which ones are the most important ones? There's lots of forest blocks. There's one over there, there's one over there. But tools like Vermont Conservation Design have actually done the legwork to say, these are the highest priority areas. And this is why, and here's the science that backs it up. OK, great. Um, uh, we had a joint meeting with the House it feels like a very long time ago, maybe it was January. And I think that was part of what we walked through. Uh, Commissioner Snyder, were you there with that, that day? A, a scientist from the Nature Conservancy came in, I think, and spoke with us. But I think we also started out with, uh, you know, a Vermont-based tool. And I think it might have been your work on the conservation design. Is that right? Uh, thanks, Senator. I was uh, not in attendance. I'm very, quite familiar with it. I know the work. I've seen others uh, such as wasn't able that day. Um, but uh, the Vermont Conservation Design, in fact, is is built from originally the uh, resilient landscapes work at the Nature Conservancy, which is what you heard about. And so it very much consistent reflects, and it's just uh, as Charlie's been describing, it's the Vermont approach to applying that same thinking of as Eric would say, conserving the stage, not just the actors, uh, and um, identifying those hot spots. You you had recently this winter, uh, Fish and Wildlife Commissioner Porter and his team in gave a they gave you some background, a very excellent overview of that um, uh, of how how it would apply and uh, Eric's uh, take on how it how it could in, you know is used. Uh, presently on state lands and in private lands uh, and with the caution about it's it's unintended for um, the their regulatory oversight role um, and at that point I really should pause and let Commissioner Porter take over uh, for anything further on that but uh, Charlie's got it right here with what it is how it relates to that TNC work uh, and what you've heard you have heard uh, excellent testimony from the scientists at Fish and Wildlife who developed it right. primarily we, we had a bit of a role in it but it's really yeah. theirs and uh, Charlie's got it right here okay well thanks uh, I knew we had seen it and I would just was actually honestly having a little trouble remembering who talked to us about it when but yeah uh, okay well great so uh any committee questions for Mr. Hancock while he's with us Senator Campion uh, I, not really a question, but I was the one who asked for, you know, to hear from multiple foresters, uh, you know, on these kinds of issues. So I appreciate Charlie coming down, um, or not coming down as usual, but, but calling down. Uh, it's helpful to hear your perspective. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. All right. Um, Senator Parent. I would just like to ask what Charlie's perspective is on, on why we're having forest, you know, fragmentation to save Vermont. I think you know, I always look at it as most people who own forest land in Vermont want to keep it, but the high cost yeah. of owning that land seems to be why they have to develop it. You know, I, I look at even where I live in St. Albans, they're building seven new homes next to me, which was forest land, but ultimately it was a retired family trying to stay in their homestead and they had to sell the yeah. land off. So I don't know if you, what you see up in Montgomery or around your yeah. work around that. No, I think I think that um, at, the, at the foundation, like the root of this is our goal is to keep forests as forests, right? Um, and there's multiple tools to do that. There's, um, there's tools like we're talking about here, um, regulatory tools, Act 250, um, the road rule. There's also tools um, that help make owning forests more economically viable, right? There's the current use program, which helps there. There's developments in carbon markets that we're looking at. So keeping the ability to own forests um, economically viable to, by supporting markets and opportunities there is equally important because as you point out, if someone can't afford to own forest land or hold forest land or pass that land to their kids or their grandkids, that's gonna be a trigger where we might see development. Um, now, you know, I would separate out something like the landowner or the farmer that needs to sell a couple lots to make ends meet or wants to transfer some land to their kid. 
Um, I would separate that from something like we've seen in the example that I gave here in Montgomery, where it is a developer who's come in, he's bought a 200 acre parcel with the specific intent of chopping it up into small lots. Um, now, it's not to say that you know, dense development isn't appropriate in certain areas. It's just that we want to, um, as, as planners, make sure that where that happens, it's done appropriately. And again, you know, even when it comes to the economic angle of it, if designed differently, that developer could have um, done the development that he wanted to do. It would have looked differently. The lots would have been uh, sized differently and maybe spaced differently, but he, he still could have done the development. So I don't think we're removing that kind of economic arrow from our quiver so much as we're just ensuring that when we shoot it, it hits the target in the right place. You're uh, muted, uh, Senator Bray. On the development in Montgomery, was there um, any, did it end up, uh, well, I'll just say it this way, a little bit cookie cutter approach, you know, as opposed to a common road branching, keeping a larger block intact, sort of the old plan residential development model where there was common land and smaller lots adjacent? No, this was your classic chop it up put a big road through, put roads off the road and do it in a way that doesn't trigger Act 250. Um, I mean, when I first looked at this project, I had to go over it three or four times to figure out how he got away with doing it without triggering any kind of Act 250 um, review. Um, but yeah, it wasn't done with any, I mean, we, we do see really smart developments in, in areas around here that do things like reserve common land. And it's a tool that we use not just for forestry, but for ag purposes as well. So those, those developments are happening. Um, and again, these provisions that we're talking about would still allow for that. Yep. Oh, I think you're still muted. Uh, we have only about five minutes. I wanna just ask a quick thing. Since you do a, a variety of uh, consulting on forest blocks, you, you had mentioned the forks products processing industry provisions related to this. So what kind of opportunities do you see possible that um, now maybe due to permitting reasons are, are not going forward? Um, and, and how do they relate to uh, you know, basically keeping forest forest, generating the income off those parcels? What, what's available to us or and I'll ask here because this is one of the things someone has said to me. They go, "Well, it's it's very unlikely this will quote unquote work for Vermont because uh, Quebec has a very sophisticated, subsidized, large scale uh, processing setup up there. So it'll still pay to ship them up. It'll be very hard for Vermont to do this. Uh, I would like not to think that that's true, but uh, do is there a local woods?" Uh, opportunity just like we've picked up in the last 10 years on local food? Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think there's some much broader uh, things that we have to consider when we start comparing ourselves to Quebec. We can get into energy policy, healthcare policy, things like that. Um, but as far as the provisions that we're looking at here, the things about flexibility of hours of operation, when products can be delivered, um, and also specifically the, um, the prime ag soils mitigation, dropping that to a one-to-one -one ratio, those, those have real impacts for mills around here. You know, there's a, there's a little sawmill down in Fletcher called um, Laughing Stock Farm, LSF. Um, as an aside, they've been busier than ever with some of the demand we're seeing for all the products that people want to put in their raised beds and do those deck projects now that they're stuck at home. Um, so it's been good for them. But they, they, a couple of years ago, had an issue where they wanted to expand some just to create a little bit more capacity for storage um, because they're growing as a business that we wanted to see. But when a business like that does something and they end up taking more land, which is on these prime ag soils, um, they get slammed with, with roadblocks, with um, economic roadblocks. Uh, and so that, that really limits their ability to, um, to develop and grow. And in such, it limits our ability to expand markets for local wood. Um, and I think we also, especially with the ag soils mitigation issue, have to look at the fact that um, supporting and strengthening and growing the forest products industry, back to Senator Perrin's kind of comments, you know, strengthening that industry is gonna strengthen the opportunity for markets for landowners to sell these products. And again, if we do that, we get better markets, we get better pricing, the landowners get a better income um, from what they're selling. 
and, and it works because that's another tool to keep our forests as forests. And so um, while I think that some of these provisions aren't going to immediately make us, you know, incredibly high and above what we're doing with Quebec, I mean, I can tell you right now here in Montgomery that we're probably going to still send wood to Amex up and across the border. Um, but these are going to go a long way to helping, you know, those operations that are here, whether it's Goodrich, whether it's Laughingstock Farm, grow in the ways they want to, to really kind of grow this industry here in Vermont. And I do think that there is a more, um, uh, a more growing um, desire to have local wood, um, similar as you point out to the local food movement. Um, it's not there yet, but I think we can get it there. Okay. Um, and since you serve on a select board and you've dealt with all, you know, how to manage a community, um, do you have any concerns around, in, in essence, we're, we would end up with sort of commercial industrial development in what might be re generally otherwise be ag residential? Um, Yep. So I think that looking to the uh, municipality's town's, town's plan to, to help govern that, you know, and help use that as part of the review review criteria um, would go a long way. I think, I think what you're getting at is, um, you know, if someone wanted to put in a junkyard in the middle of Montgomery Center, would that have a negative impact to Montgomery Center? And my answer would be obviously yes. Um, but I think there's other mechanisms in place through which we can avoid those kind of developments. Um, so we have the mechanisms to address those kind of concerns, but this would essentially ease the process. So where that same lot, if somebody wanted to put in um, kind of a higher density, low income or senior housing project, that would be um, easier to do. And that's the kind of development that we do want to see. And again, which isn't reflected in our town plan. Sure. Okay, great. Well, um, I'm looking around to see if there are any other committee questions or comments. Um, and there are a number of people in the room. Uh, before we uh, sign off for today, I wanna to go through one very brief amendment for the floor and get the committee's feedback on it. Um, but I just wanna say, is there anyone in the room who wants to flag anything for the committee for a, a next conversation that we'll be have? Obviously we're, we're not, we don't have a finished amendment, but we're on our way towards one. Okay, so. Thanks. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It's been a very helpful and informative two hours. Um, with that, we'll finish on the Act 250 stuff. And